turn to the Gospel of Luke. We're here once again the familiar Christmas story. <coughs> Luke chapter 2, <coughs> verses 1 through 20. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. And in that region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them in heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go into Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. <coughs> and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw they made known the saying which had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary kept all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen and had been told them. This is the reading of the word, right? Thanks be to God. Merry Christmas! Right? Those secretive nights and early mornings of present purchasing and wrapping... The expectation, the excitement, and the messy chaos after presents are unwrapped. The special time with family and loved ones is pretty much over. While we might be in the season of Christmas, for many of us it is over. Done with. We began to put away our gifts, clean up our homes, the decorations are being packed, up, put away, right? Yeah. We're attempting in some ways to return to normalcy <coughs> in our lives. We're in a little bit of a letdown, right? After the big event. The big day has come and gone, and in some ways we get the time to breathe a big sigh of relief before the next big event. It is in our nature, is it not, to view the Advent as a build-up to the big event of Christmas, and then in the couple of weeks that follow, we kind of finish up with Epiphany. And even with Epiphany coming, we still typically act as if Christmas is over. We no longer view this season as a season of build-up to another part of the story. We act almost as if Christmas is the climax of the story. And everything else is just a falling action, and it just kind of ends with Jesus' ministry. How many of us are familiar with the, the common plot outline that we learned in English class? Right, you should be. If not, you're hearing it again. The simplest form is exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and resolution. Right? Essentially, the setting and the basic information, the interactions that bring the characters together, the climax of importance, the fallout after the climax, and then how the characters resolve from the climax. That is the most basic of story plot lines that we learn early, and then as we are asked 
to expand upon our stories, we realize that they're not often so triangular. There can be smaller climaxes. And in literary terms, these are called inciting incidences or conflicts that lead us to our ultimate climax, a.k.a. the whole point of our story. Advent is over, and we are in the season of Christmas, and next Sunday we celebrate Epiphany, but there is more. So much more to Jesus' life. It wasn't the two separate climactic events of Christmas and Easter. It was a series of events, called them inciting incidents, that led to the ultimate climax of his crucifixion. Rather than straight up and down, it's a series of hills and veils that lead to a very specific point and purpose. His death. For our sin. We're only in the beginning of the story and are still in the point of rising in action, and yet too often we lose sight of that, and our faith momentum wanes as the new year begins. The spirituality of Christmas Eve sends us reverently towards Christmas Day, but then it seems due to the expectations of the holiday. Instead of seeing it all as holy days, from which begins every other holy day, we, see, we, we sit and heave a big sigh of relief that it's kind of over. It's kind of where we fail. That's where we fail as Christians in our lives of faith. We forget to continue to build up, and instead we take kind of a break in between Christmas and Easter, or we take a break in between Easter and Christmas. We're only remembering instead of living. You see, we begin each Advent with a simple enough theme focused on hope, peace, <coughs> joy, and love for each Sunday, and finally on Christmas Eve, the light. That precious light comes into the world to penetrate our darkness, the darkness of the sin in our lives. The story that we heard again this morning is perhaps the most familiar and beautiful of the scripture passages about Jesus' birth. And we hear it, but we don't experience it in the same way that the people did who actually lived it out. You see, we're not waiting for the Messiah to come for the first time. We're waiting for the Messiah to come again. That is the distinct difference in how we understand the story, because we are not waiting for the Messiah. We know him. We know him. His name is Jesus. We can open our Bibles and turn the pages and see the stories of his lives and model our own lives after them. He is the entire reason we are called Christian. So we're not waiting for the Messiah. We're waiting for the Messiah to come again. But we don't know who or what the new Messiah will look like. Because the Messiah's birth that we celebrate and remember each year is part of the expected. It is not a new revelation, and we seemingly forget its significance. Our momentum is lost, and we just live our lives, marking each season with a holiday, not a holy day. You see, that's been our theme this Advent and Christmas season, to look at our scriptures, to look and rethink this entire Christmas season than what we've always thought about it, to view it as holy days, not holidays. But we recognize in some way and in some reality that we're 2,000 years removed from the miracle of Christ's birth. So it begs the question, if it happened today, what would it look like? 
Would it happen in a hospital bed? Would it happen at home? Would the Messiah come as another baby boy? Or perhaps would the Messiah come as a baby girl? Would we recognize the Messiah if he or she walked in this room? Do we even have to? You see, the Messiah came as a child, so to shake up our preconceived ideas of what a Savior looked like initially. He was not recognized by others except those informed by the angels of his coming. <coughs> but though we did not recognize him as a child, we came to know and see him as a youth in the temple and as a young adult beginning his ministry. We also recognize that potential in ourselves. You see, the 2,000 plus years since our Savior's birth, the understanding of how we live out our faith and wait for our Messiah to come has changed. The world has changed. Because we have in our minds some idea of what the Messiah is to be and what he or she will do, we have grown complacent. We grow complacent in our levels of inaction and remembrance. I'm not saying that this complacency is necessarily a bad thing because it's important in understanding our faith foundation. But what comes after that foundation is laid? How do we build our houses of faith? How do we keep on growing and changing and adding as needed and tearing down as needed so that we stand strong and firm? How do we get out of the familiar and instead of viewing Christmas and Easter as two important events, we view them as just part of the momentum of our faith? And just reminders of how to share our faith with the world. We should use them as foundational building blocks upon which we can share the good news. Because though they are important, there is so much more to the story. Our scripture is only part of it. We are the other part. How we take our scripture, how we take our knowledge, and how we adapt our knowledge of Christ and take it to the world. That's our calling. That's the challenge of the momentum of the holy days, not the holidays. We can either choose to, in the new year, to build up and continue rolling with our faith momentum. Or we can heave that sigh of relief and look towards the next big event. It is our choice. Each time we hear a familiar story, each time we sing a familiar song, each time we come to worship, we are given that choice. Amen.